Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Noteworthy History with our series finale on the Suez Canal. I'm your host, Tong, and joining me today are Shayna. Hello. Andy. Hello. Luke. Hoi. And Will. Nope, just Andy again. <laughs> I That's really right. couldn't tell the difference <laughs> in that voice. <laughs> yeah, it's a little similar. Yeah. We can all now, be we can be seen as one collective. It works well enough. You're just a hive mind. You're the who's. Hive mind of two, which kind of sucks. Yeah. It's, there's not much of a mind to hive right there either. No yeah. offense. Um, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> now, in our uh, last episode, we saw just how, with a bit of financial tact, the brilliant Khedive of Egypt sold first the canal and then his own country to Western powers. And when the Egyptian people spoke out about getting swindled, the British gave the good old-fashioned response of, fuck you, we're going to land an army and make you a colony. Um, so yeah, not a good place to leave Egypt. But with this episode here, we're going to fast forward from the late 1800s to the mid-1950s, where as Britain and France's colonial empires start crumbling after World War II, they're going to start digging their heels in on the Suez Canal when Egypt's new president, Nasser, decides to nationalize the canal. I'm sure nothing bad will happen after that. No, let's go perfectly fine. There's a well, reason so it's not called the Suez Canal Crisis. Huh. What? Oh, crisis? No, Spoiler. there's no crisis in the Suez. Mm-hmm. You know, actually, funnily enough on that, um, I mean, I was just talking about this a bit earlier, but like my first ever exposure to the Suez Canal, like in terms of like that term being a thing in my head, is uh, from... You know that that Billy Joel song, uh, We Didn't Start the Fire? I think it's the only Billy Joel song that everybody knows, yeah. Nah, come on, Piano Man. Everyone knows Piano Man. Yeah, but like, I mean, it's his most famous song by far, right? Wait, there are three Billy Joel songs that people will generally know, and it's uh, Piano Man, We Didn't Start the Fire, and Uptown. Oh yeah, Uptown Girl, that's another one too. Yes, not Uptown Funk? Uh, No, that is... uh, I yeah. might know Piano Man. I can't say I know the other two, to be honest. You don't know We Didn't Start the Fire. The chorus literally goes, We didn't start the fire. It was Listen, as a kid. Yeah, okay, so we don't need to. This is not, <laughs> this is not American Idol. This is a history. As a kid, I was always. I didn't know any of the lyrics, but I still sort of enjoyed it because he said the funny phrase. Yeah, it, it just sounded very much like an. Like, fuck the system kind of song it's like you know like the world's fucked up but not because of me here's a bunch of reasons why it's fucked up and then and he basically like, mm-hmm. list sings the entirety of it yeah you can't so. hear any of it but it sounds good yeah no honestly like except for like uh jfk blown away what else do i oh. have to say and also there's like oh one other line that i remember it's like uh trouble in the suez yeah yeah because it ends the verse so you can actually understand it exactly yeah so it always sticks in your head Right. That's where but, I heard of it. But like as a result, I was like, first off, where the where is the Suez, and why is there trouble in the Suez? So like I I never quite got that. But um, as we're going to dive into today, we're going to be exploring a bit of that. So and also, uh, Shayna, I believe you actually took a class touching on this stuff too, right? Yes, I did. I took a class at Boston University. Uh, credits will be um in on the youtube i believe but <laughs> yeah. it was a great class so i do have some i'll probably be butting in with some knowledge about nasa and just you know some details about that so yeah look make, forward to it make sure to use mli format when citing the Whoa. No, no, no. A- oh, you APA, APA, apa or chicago chicago style dude. <laughs> if you're studying history you gotta use chicago style there's no MLA is for middle school teachers like Idiot. actually what, like what, no one really dog? uses mla in college it's a great way to increase your word count, though. All those parenthetical citations oh just really God. add oh, to your yeah. count. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you can't really talk about the Suez Canal and the Canal Crisis without really talking about the chap Nasser. Um, basically, he came about as like, if you guys remember from the last episode, we talked about this colonel, uh, uh, Urabi, who like stood up against British, like, imperialism in egypt and he like tried to like lead a revolt and then got unfortunately completely crushed he's like this the more successful version of urabi um just transplanted to the 50s rather than the late 1800s um but yeah like urabi he came in with like uh like a more like middling 
to like almost peasant like background and he had to make his way up through the army and uh he also came up in a time in egypt where there was a lot of anti-british sentiment um now things i can't happen- imagine why yeah it's not know, like they, they took just, their canal in their country yeah why would they be pissed about that well if you wanted to find another reason to be pissed it's because world war ii happened and they basically doubled down on egypt so yeah people never really one. talk about like the african side of world oh war yeah II. Who, who, what side was uh egypt on in world war ii well after world war one started uh britain just gave up maintaining the guys that they were still going to be ruling egypt but in the name of the ottoman empire because the ottomans sided with the germans so britain's like haha that's our excuse yes uh we're just gonna make it our protectorate so they go ahead they make the khedive now the king of egypt uh still of the line of muhammad ali um and then they go ahead and basically put their troops down everywhere uh after World War I, the, the Egyptians were like, hey, we didn't really like that. So can you like give us some more constitutional powers and ability to represent ourselves? And uh, this was led by a group known as the Waft Party. And they actually were able to send a delegation to the peace conference at Versailles. So they gained some credibility and the British were like, all right, fine. We'll give you some leeway in how you run your fucking country. I mean, but- the Treaty of Versailles <laughs> was notorious for working very well. So oh, I'm pretty yes, sure absolutely. everything went well. Yeah, and then it afterwards... stopped all colonial <laughs> powers from uh, imposing their will on other contra- countries. Yeah, exactly. there were no Greater like... East prosperity spheres. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Now. <laughs> Self-determination <laughs> did not apply there. They're like, nah, not that, not that region. <laughs> yeah. Italy would never try to do something in Africa. No, sir, ridiculous. definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, after the Waf Party did this like big success, it's like, woo, we won some rights. We have like an elected body that actually has some power. Then they were like, all right, now the Brits want us to do this. Let's just keep our heads down. We got what we wanted. We're now technically our own country. Uh, and we'll just listen to the king and we'll do all this stuff. So they started like sliding back, especially once their leader died. So then another group came up to speak on behalf of the people. This is a group known as the, the Muslim Brothers, or I guess you might know them as the Muslim Brotherhood. Kind of a big deal in Egypt still to this day, although they're technically illegal. Um they're more religiously based uh they're more like about social charity and common religious and national solidarity and uh at first they were a peaceful movement they're more just like you know what the british don't know how to actually help out the people so we'll run the soup kitchens we'll make sure we get you guys clothed and fed we'll pay for the schools you know we'll actually do the governing while you guys do the exploiting uh, but then after a while they're like oh wait hold on a sec why are we letting you get away with exploiting us so <laughs> You know, they started actually trying to be a bit more militant, at least politically speaking, more militant for an independent Egypt. And uh, and then World War II happened. And British uh, interests were like, well, we got to hold on to Egypt because we don't want the Germans to attack India or the Italians to just take over North Africa. Which, if you know the Italians, the, the chances of them taking over North Africa were pretty abysmal, to say the least. <laughs> I mean, they tried. Yeah, they tried. That's about Ethiopia. Yeah, yeah, Ethiopia, right? Yeah, they got yeah. Ethiopia because <laughs> a little you know, bit, a little bit. But like, um, I mean, I mean, technically, Vichy France still controlled Algeria, um, but Britain held Egypt, and uh, they were able to push the Italians back. Still, of the Axis powers, Italy is the little brother. Ah, uh, I mean, of the three big ones, yes, yeah. you could technically. Uh, like, uh, yeah, there are definitely other Axis like, powers. That's fair, but like, yeah. It's the weakest of the triumvirate, I guess. That's fair. That's very fair. Yeah, Mussolini was not very capable in uh, in North Africa by any means. But still, the British saw that as a threat. And then when they, the Germans said, like, all right, fine, let's, uh, let's send you Rommel and you guys can have fun in North Africa, crush the British while we're busy taking on the Russians, you know. Um, at that point, the British actually had to put in some more concerted efforts. But the thing is, when you start pouring a bunch of troops from a foreign country into Egypt, a bunch of people that have their own different habits. And once again, these are soldiers. So they're young, virile men who want a way to get their, you know, their fun on a Sunday night. Mm. And next thing you know, all throughout Cairo, you see brothels and shit spouting up. So familiar. Yeah, it it Mm -hmm. does sound very familiar. Like when the French used to be in Cairo back in the day. (laughs) Um, But basically the idea is that the Egyptian populace wasn't a fan. Also, the army kind of just buys shit regardless of the price. So 
if you're trying to fight over a loaf of bread, the British are going to outbid you every single time. So the price of food and all that just goes right through the roof. So uh, the British, not exactly a fan of this whole thing. Also, at this point, the Muslim brothers, they got their leadership assassinated. So at this point, they're like, we tried the peaceful route. So, you know, let's grab some guns and start shooting. And uh, they move out and they start really taking on some more guerrilla activity, especially in the canal zone. Uh, they start taking pot shots on the British while making overtures to the Nazis, who they actually saw as like ardent nationalists. Yeah, which is I'm sure these guys will be good friends with us. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, it's, you know, like the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So it's like, you hate the British? Well, clearly you must have some sense about you, you know? So <laughs> there were uh, actually some overtures to the Nazis. And in fact, a rise of a group called the Young Egyptians, uh, otherwise known oh. as the Green Shirts. Um, oh, no. Yeah, good. who were mm. kind of fascists and uh, very mm-hmm. anti-British and also anti-monarchy because the king uh, basically was like a puppet for the the british like there was one time where he tried to stand up uh when instead of the waf party being elected into power the muslim brotherhood won most of the votes and the british are like but we kind of like the people who didn't shoot at us so uh we're just going to send a bunch of tanks down to the palace and tell the king you're either going to abdicate or you're going to give the win over to the waf party and the king i mean it's kind of a tough choice there you know (laughs) so uh, but he did cave, and everyone was like, ooh, fuck you, king. You should have been shot. And he's like, bro, what do you want me to do? You know? So. Probably get shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, after World War II, all this tension's rising, right? Um, and, uh, oh, also, funnily enough, amongst the young Egyptians, there's a certain chap by the name of Gamal Abdul Nasser. You know, a guy who's a... a a young military officer and a young Egyptian who wants to see the British out of his country. And he's like trying to like gauge the scene and, uh, you know, also seek a chance for promotion and the like, well, sure enough, uh, that chance happens in 1948 when Israel declares itself a country, uh, obviously also displacing a lot of Arab Palestinians from their homeland in the process. Um, so, Egypt's king, King Farouk, is like, you know what? Now is my chance to shine. Like, they thought I was a collaborator with the British. Well, I don't play by anyone's rules but my own. So I'm going to go organize an Arab League of seven different countries, and we're going to knock the stuffing out of Israel. So, um, basically, King Farouk organizes an army, tries to take on Israel, and fails miserably. And the military, which at this point was already looking at Egypt's king as like, you know, a pushover. Uh, Next thing you know, uh, Egypt's king trying to organize that war against Israel. Because after it completely goes south uh, in 1949, um, the king just lost all sorts of credibility with the public, with the military, with anyone. So sure enough, after a few more years, uh, in 1952 a group of people known as the Egyptian Free Officers, which is like, if you want to think about it, almost like a subsect of the young Egyptians, um, go ahead and uh, launch a coup, which forces the abdication of King Farouk. And uh, for a time, at least, they maintain the monarchy and they put into power his like infant son by the name of Said II, I want to say. Uh, Fuad II. Fuad II. The guy's still alive at this point, you know. Classic um, move. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, oust your he's opponents like, and replace them with a literal it, child. A baby. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that uh, that didn't really quite last too long. And that's partially because of Nasser. So uh, the whole coup was officially organized under the control of a general by the, na- the name of General Nagib. But Nagib's vision is that, like, all right, we kicked out a corrupt king. We got rid of the waft who like are still basically pansies for the British in our country. Uh, why don't we just go ahead um, and get a new civilian government and then we could just back off. We'll maintain the monarchy. We'll entertain the idea of a child being in charge, but we'll have like an elected civil government and all that stuff and everything's going to be fine. You know, that's Nagib style. We're just stepping in here as a temporary stopgap. Um, and Nasser, on the other hand, is like, well, 
I mean, we already have the power. Why not just run with it, you know? Like, look, we've given civilian governments power in the past. The Waft came in, took over the power, and then they became suckers for the British. The king came in, claimed to fight on our side. Next thing you know, he's trying to, like, bow and scrape to the freaking British. Every single time we try to get a civilian government in there, they don't have the power to push back against outside forces. But we're the military. We know what's up. We got guns. We got tanks. We could push back the British if we wanted to, you know? So why don't we just hold on to that? And uh, after a bit more internal politicking, he was able to, like, oust Nagib and basically take over as president of Egypt. Um which wasn't very popular for the Muslim brothers who, you know, they were like, we kind of want civilian government, you know. We don't really like this radical, what they viewed as a secularist, taking over in Egypt. But uh, for their troubles and an attempted assassination of Nasser by them, uh, hmm. they then get banned. So, yeah. Hmm. Fascism. They, uh, fascism. It kind of has a thing. Especially when their leader almost gets assassinated by them. That, that tends to give some good incentive to go ahead and ban some political parties. But, I mean, Nasser was, he might have had some initial fascist underpinnings, but if anything, he was a very ardent socialist. I mean, I mean the term was Arab socialism. This, this kind of like redistributive mentality to like be able to lift the Middle East out of like its industrializing phase into an industrialized country. One that's like able to compete with the West in terms of its modernity and in terms of its production capabilities. How does that compare it to non-Arab socialism? Well, it's Arab socialism insofar as it still maintains a lot of like Arab cultural heritage, it, as well as a lot of Muslim uh, or Islamic influences on certain redistributions. Like, for so example, it's... like Nasser would like seek out the blessings of like the religious elite for his different like policies and stuff. And he would like and couch that in like, you know, the Quran says, you know, you have to take care of the poor. So this is how we're going to do it. You know, very different uh, from so, Marx. Yeah. Whereas Marx is more just like, it's because of the proletarian struggle mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So that's uh, not so much. It's, uh, and also it's Arab in the sense of uh, a pan Arabist yeah. mentality. So is it uh, sort of um, similar yeah. to like pan Africanism with Gaddafi or is it like, well, funnily enough, Gaddafi, created pan-africanism after he attempted pan-arabism but the arab countries refused to accept him as like a powerful enough ally uh, so yeah I, he was just like fine you don't want to play with me i'll go and make my own friends somewhere else you yeah i'll start my own cool kids club so he goes off and starts that and then he invades african countries like chad and then gets his ass whooped so what do you expect when you try to invade a man named chad what are, you, what are you gonna do <laughs> yeah you know what are you gonna do with your tanks they got their toyota pickup trucks mounted with like machine guns and jeeps the, no straight up just toyota pickup trucks oh, you're right. it's like yeah you're right it was it was actually kind of badass how they did it but that, that's a whole separate thing Gaddafi is <laughs> kind of a clown in his own right a terrifying clown but a clown nonetheless um <laughs> kind of like kind of like north africa's version of mussolini they tried to get him a bunch of times but they never did they did, and he lasted for quite a while in the grand scheme. It's of like dictator. how Castro got, uh, got you know there were like three hundred attempted assassinations on Castro, and then he just had at least wow. three hundred. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> three hundred disclosed um, assassinations. Yeah, and who knows how many more? You know, I mean, um, what? How do you do that? Like, you gotta like set up the anvil on the top of his stairs, and the bottom of the stairs, you set like a, <laughs> like a mouse trap or something. How do you do three hundred? <laughs> He, he, he's sending them things about. stuff from Acme all the time. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> they paint holes in the walls and they try to get him to drive through. I yeah. remember there was a, an account in which they literally tried to sell him like uh, like explosive cigars. <laughs> so like when he would light it, it would blow up in his face. <laughs> wow. But it just, it, it either didn't go off or, you know, it's communist there. He doesn't buy fucking cigars from Western imperialist pigs. So he just didn't use them. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of, Half of them, quite frankly, were just like, look, we are anti-communists, so we will support the Cuban refugees by carrying out these things and winning over their vote from Florida. Because Florida is a decisive voting state, yeah. like it is now. Uh, but, like, we don't expect them to work, you know? We'll just, we'll put in the old college try and call it a day kind of deal. 
So probably why not? Probably why uh, Castro survived for that long. They just didn't bother to really see it through. And also the mafia shot uh, JFK. So, mm-hmm. you know. That'll put a damper on things. Facts. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, like, unlike Pan-Africanism, Pan-Arabism was founded more on, like, the common Arab identity. Um, especially, like, the common Arab ethnicity. Uh, and as a result, a, a unified struggle against non-Arab imperialism. So they're looking at Israel, they're looking at Great Britain, they're looking at France, and they're like, fuck you, you know, you imperialist powers, we're gonna show you what for by becoming strong, independent countries that will support each other, you know? But, like, at this point, it was more just like a general rallying cry. A lot of the people in charge are still, like, kings that seize power because the British put them into power. Like, the country of Transjordan, which is now Jordan, was, and still is, ruled by the people that the British paid to help fight uh, in World War II for a period. Um, and uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, is contr- or paid to fight in World War I during the Arab revolts, Lawrence of Arabia and all that stuff. Uh, Saudi Arabia is still on good terms with Great Britain. Uh, France and Lebanon are still pretty tight. So like, there's, there is pan-Arabist underpinnings for a lot of these countries, but no country has been powerful enough to like take it and make it their thing. But Nasser's doing it. Except he's kind of like weaving it in to become a uh, kind of a cult, per- uh, like a cult personality kind of deal. So like, it- it's not just pan-Arabism, it's Nasserism, you know? Like, we like pan-Arabism when it's embodied in the form of Nasser, not it's in any other. Stalin dealio? Yeah, yeah, very much like that. Um, except imagine if like, because um... like Stalinism did have more than just a cult personality thing. Nasserism was basically... Arab socialism and pan-Arabism all in the shell of this very, very charismatic military leader. So, you know, it, it's, it's kind of got its own twist. And there's a reason why we don't hear much about it anymore after he died. Because once he's gone, it's gone. Whereas Stalinism, you can still get forms of it popping up, just like Maoism popping up every once in a while. Right. So, because it has its like, own independent ideology and identity independent of the person it was associated with right so yeah but i mean say what you will nasser comes in he claims to be this revolutionary hero and he does get some stuff done like uh for example he got rid of the british um in 52 he starts negotiating with the british to get them to evacuate egypt which is a kind phrase of saying just you know fuck off out of our country um and uh in 54, they finally reach an agreement where they're like, all right, fine, we'll leave everything, including the, the Suez Canal, but we do have the right to come in here if you guys get attacked or we think you're under attack by, I don't know, the Soviets or something, because they're clearly right next to you. Um, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so like we, we maintain our right to intervene in Egypt militarily if it's to benefit the Egyptians. Yes. <laughs> to, not, not our interests. What are we talking about? No. I feel um, like a military but, leader yeah. would be able to see something's up with that. Yeah, yeah, but like, you know, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth. To be fair, funnily enough, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, the guys who were like anti Nasser and tried to assassinate him, they were actually the critics of this deal in Egypt who were like, dude, you should push a bit harder. Like, this isn't enough. And <laughs> Nasser, meanwhile, is like, silence you and just kicks them out. So. You know, they, there, there they, they may have uh, kind of thrown away a lot of their goodwill. Yeah, yeah, which is funny because at first, both the young, like the, uh, the free officers like Nasser and the um, the uh, the Muslim Brotherhood actually worked hand in hand to overthrow the king. And now they're like at each other's necks. Who knew revolutionaries would eat each other like that? Yeah. Right? You know, <laughs> never saw that before. Um, but basically, they negotiate a deal. The, the canal is still owned by the Suez Canal Company which, if you recall, was basically completely controlled by the British and the French. Um, But by April of 1956, all British troops had evacuated from the canal. So 1956, a pretty significant year. Um, Another interesting thing, too, is that Nasser goes ahead, really takes that socialism thing to heart, and starts nationalizing all the key stuff in Egypt, from banks to shipping ports to, you know, large agricultural communes and stuff like that. And uh, 
he also tries to go ahead and um, you know maintain his independence despite being technically socialist. You know, because like especially Americans when they hear the term socialist during this era, they're like, ah, oh, he's a communist. <laughs> yeah, Commie. but he's he's gonna fall the. To socialism gonna, every day now. It's the domino theory. Yeah. Next thing you know, the Egyptians are going to be waving around the hammer and sickle. Um, so America, at this point, they go ahead and try to do this thing called the Baghdad Pact. Um, I don't have a lot of knowledge on this stuff. Um, but like, and, and Shanna, feel free to jump in if you have mm. anything more on this. But like, from my understanding, it's basically like a mutual defense pact which is just to keep the countries on the good side of America and not on the side of the communists. Something like that. Yeah, I, I believe that's it. I think I know more about, um, I guess, the later stuff with the Suez Canal, but he did pander to both um, the U.S. and the Soviet Union, um, kind of veering away from that a little bit. I'm just going to say that um, this is happening in the context of the Cold War, right? So he... Right in order to maintain independence, he's really smart about it because he understands that America is not the only superpower now. They have a competing superpower. So he can play both of them off each other to get what he wants. So I think maintaining the good books with both of them was a really hard thing for him, but it worked in his favor at this point because they both wanted his power. Pan-Arabism really elevated him as a leader in the Middle East region. So, Absolutely, yeah. And also just to, you know, be sure that he could stay, you know, a free player. You know, he refused to join the Baghdad Pact and actually kind of did, just to show how much street cred he had with Middle Eastern countries, he was able to convince Syria and Transjordan to not join the Baghdad Pact either. Um, but on, on the flip side, he was also like, hey, America, uh, I was thinking about taking out a, a small loan of about a billion dollars trying to build this new Aswan Dam and it's costing me way too much money so you know you got this world bank thing going on just give me a nice loan i'll pay you back <laughs> you know egypt's always good on paying back on its debt <laughs> right yeah. mm-hmm. we'll even mortgage our country if need be um but uh yeah so they were in the midst of negotiating this whole thing when america in 1956 uh goes ahead and yoinks the deal off the table it's not exactly clear why but i'm assuming the fact that they refused to join the baghdad pact kind of rubbed them the wrong way mm-hmm. also, and then they also oh wait well, you're gonna go oh, no, no, with it. you go ahead you go ahead I think <laughs> oh, no, not, yeah yeah as oh, they also did um they signed an arms deal with um i guess a part of the ussr czechoslovakia so they um really um the u.s was really annoyed about that because you're signing an arms deal with the enemy once again it's communism or the u.s there's no gray area so for right. them that was betrayal and then they also recognized um uh the prc uh, so Beijing and China, because yeah, the um, communist China, point. basically, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So them recognizing a communist country just was also another affront. So a couple of these steps just made the U.S. not trust um, Nasser as well as they could. Yeah, and meanwhile, Nasser is just looking at this from like his own problems, because like uh, since like the defeat in 1949 by Israel, uh, there's just been constant border skirmishes between Israel. Mm-hmm. And Egypt, as well as like Palestinian refugees in Egypt, launching attacks on Israel. The only difference is that, like, as evidenced by the fact that Israel was able to knock off seven different countries' militaries, um, Israel was kind of outclassing everyone uh, in like in terms of its regional neighbors, uh, and so Egypt was kind of getting the short end of the stick when it's like, you know, oh, we'll send some people with guns over there to shoot up a small town. And then Israel responds by firing an artillery barrage that levels a village in Egypt. And they're like, wait, hold on. That's uh, it's not exactly equal play here. So Nasser wanted to first turn to the U.S. for weapons. But the U.S. was supporting Israel at this point. So they're like, ah, I see what you're doing there, Nasser. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get any of our advanced weaponry. So Nasser's like, fine, I'll go to the Soviets. They'll help me mm-hmm. out. And of course, the Soviets were like, well, technically, comrade, we are not allowed to arm you as a neutral power, but we can ask our What ally, sort of accent state. is this, dude? This is, a- <laughs> this is a neutral Soviet accent. I am speaking on behalf of the international relations theory of realism. We are reaching out our deal to the Czechoslovakian. I- they will sell you weapons. We sell them at a discount rate. And you come to Ikea, you pick up and you take back and you do whatever you want with Israel. You know. I feel like I, I liked it better when you only just did 
Uh, British accents for everyone, no matter who. <laughs> you gotta hit him with the Queen's, you know, Queen's Latin, the Queen's Russian. The Queen's Russian. Yeah. Yikes. Well, thankfully, this is going to be the last time you'll hear about the Soviets in the Middle East, or the Russians, for that matter. So <laughs> you won't need to worry about that accent popping up again. Oh. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So once again, quick summary. 1956, the Brits finally get all their troops out of the canal area. 1956, the U.S. yoinks a major $1 billion loan package from the table. In 1956, the border skirmishes with Israel finally start reaching ahead with the Egyptians. They, you know, they stop, uh, they stop just accepting their lumps at this point. So, on July 26, 1956, Nasser goes ahead and nationalizes the Suez Canal. Dun dun dun. <laughs> and it's, and, and you can just imagine the alarm bells going off in London and Paris at this time where they like hear that Nasser just basically stole their entire company from them. Uh, well, to be fair, Nasser did say that, like, look, I'll, I'll pay you for what we took, but like, it's kind of still our own thing. So like, don't expect us to dilly dally over whether or not you can get this canal back. You either take our bargain, you get some compensation or you get nothing pretty much. Uh, but Nasser's like, outward claim is that like the west has been exploiting egypt for centuries and now when we ask them to give us some money to develop our country they say no and yes we did buy a bunch of weapons from soviet allies to attack one of the west's allies but you know that's besides the point we're going to take this money that we're going to get from the canal and use that to pay for all the stuff that the west won't loan money for we're so, the victims here. Yeah, exactly. We're the victims here. And everyone's just like, bravo, Nasser. Yes, bravo. we are. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, like, all the Egyptians are super happy about this. And all the other Arab states, too, are like, that's what I'm talking about. That is a pan-Arab hero, you know? This um, is a pan-Arab moment. Yeah. And uh, meanwhile, in the West, uh, Britain's like, I say, I do believe we just lost all chances of maintaining our overseas empire. There to we which go. response was by India, like, what empire are you talking about? You literally just lost control of India. Why do you want to maintain these connections? You know? Um, mm -hmm. And France, meanwhile, is like, I knew it. This is the Egyptian conspiracy. This is how they're going to kick us out of North Africa. First, they start arming the revolts in Algeria because there's no reason why the Algerians would want to, you know, fight against us, their benign extortionist French overseers. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's you know. got to be so the nice result of... Exactly. It's got to be the result of those Egyptian agitators and that Nasser fella. So, like, we gotta, we gotta teach them a lesson for supporting these Algerian freedom fighters. Um, or rebels and terrorists, terrorists as the french would have known them yeah um and meanwhile israel is like well you know if we get a chance to really sock them a good one we might as well take it so they go ahead and like while they're negotiating like some sort of a deal with egypt to resolve this issue of who owns the suez canal and what the reparations are going to be uh israel france and great britain and only these three countries go ahead and create the secret tripartite alliance and coordinate a surprise invasion of the Suez Canal with the hopes to overthrow Nasser as a result. And wow. when I say surprise, it is... It's really coordinated. Now, keep in mind, mm -hmm. this nationalization thing, July 26th, so end of July, in October 29th, just a few months afterwards, also in that same year, Israel sneaks up its cannons onto the border with Egypt and starts bombarding the Sinai Peninsula, which is like Egypt's oil haven, if you will. Um, they start shooting that place up. And then next thing you know, Act 2, the British fly in and start bombing Cairo and the Canal Zone on the 31st. And Israel starts sending tanks and troops racing along the east bank of the Suez Canal. And then just a few more days later, British and French troops land at the north entrance to the Suez Canal with French paratroopers jumping in. It's like everything is going like clockwork. It's just boom, boom, boom. Everything's clicking. It's and, like uh, D-Day preparation if it worked. Yeah, no, honestly. <laughs> um, except in this case, they're going there to 
conquer a country, not to like right. liberate a country. So, um, or Semantics. I guess you could say they went in there. They went in there to liberate Egypt from the Egyptians. Yes, so, yes. <laughs> yeah. oh, Britain yeah. and Britain and France actually were like, we actually are going to come in and help you, Egypt, because you're under attack right now. So we're going to yeah. protect the canal with our military <laughs> forces, but actually we want to screw you over. So they really had this like down to the minute of how they're going to betray Egypt and really work. This They've out. done this for it a was, while. Yeah, sense. they kind mm-hmm. of have a repertoire yeah, of practice. screwing over people. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, like, the thing is, I remember when I was learning about this in my European history class, uh, our professor talked about how one of the other history professors, an older gentleman who actually retired the year before, he actually was one of the one of the British troops that were sent into the Canal Zone during this time period. Uh-huh. And, um, yeah, he, 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 would like, he was talking about how uh, one of his memories of this whole experience is that the british troops did infiltrate in um under the guise of protection uh but then they started fortifying up the towns and as things were really getting tense to the point where like at this point it's not just the egyptian army that they're fighting but the egyptian populace that's trying to storm these Mm -hmm. positions uh the british uh he, he was this professor by the name of peter reed was allegedly the last british officer ever to give the command of fixed bayonets the last one <laughs> yeah the last yeah one. i mean so that's pretty cool given that right wow. yeah why aren't that's, they fixing uh, bayonets nowadays i mean they got horses there are a lot of horses i guess it's because they already fixed the bayonets you know oh, they don't true. need to repair them again yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then, then yeah. I, no need to fix it <laughs> yeah they got better not, steel so they don't they're not going to use them, them anymore right so why not yeah why not what but, about all the horses that are running around in the battlefield? You forgot about those. All the horses, yeah. All of those yeah. horses. All right, Mitt Romney, calm down. Um, <laughs> but, but just imagine, imagine in that, that moment, moment, as the as tensions the really build, really building, you know, you know, command, command to fix bayonets, bayonets comes down, down as, the as the Egyptian people, people are really just massed to push the invaders out. All of a sudden, Britain, or Britain France, and Israel are all told to just stop and it's the soviet union and the united states both coming in at the same time being like what the fuck are you doing oh (laughs) and meanwhile britain and france are huddled over their map of africa drawing new borders and it's like i say oh chap you uh you stopped a little bit of uh you know the scramble for africa part two here (laughs) you want to join in and they're like absolutely not maybe later but (laughs) <laughs> that's not how we do it nowadays <laughs> this whole past war is a war against imperialism we're getting rid of this whole old school if you dislike a native government you just go in there with your army and push them out no now now, now we go now, in and set up 400 yeah. mcdonald's exactly and then we use the cia to initiate a coup by the local people to claim that democratic them do we overthrew their leader but that's them doing it you can't just send troops in at this point <laughs> we're more civilized than that so the Soviets, who at this point, they're like busy trying to quell a rebellion in Hungary. They're like, and now Britain, you do that again, we're going to shoot nukes at you. And they're like, wait, what? Like, all right, fine, we'll launch rockets at you. We'll do what the Germans did, you know, we'll launch rockets into London. It's going to be like the Blitz again. So stop it. And Britain's like, well, oh, we survived that once. We could survive that again. So America turns around and is like, hey, Britain, you keep this shit up. We're going to devalue your currency. And the first like, not our money. (laughs) Bretton Woods really did a whole number on (laughs) imperialism by non-American people. Yeah, Yeah, but like the moment Britain, uh, the moment America threatened to sell all of their British bonds, um, which would have just basically sent the barely recovering government of Britain into another tailspin. uh, The British were like, all right, okay, uh, chill out, old chap, I say. You know, your cousins were brothers from another mother and also from the same well, former land. But, you know? But, uh... Wait. I mean, if if we're doing it like that, wouldn't it be, like... Relative, like, child? Be quiet. Well, I'm not sure if the brothers thing works. Maybe you're talking about Britain and France, but... Yeah, you're like a little cousin, you know? <laughs> Come on now, we could have a scramble over this later on. You know, we could divide up Argentina. I heard the Falklands are very lovely this time of year. You know, you have the Monroe Doctrine, we have our conquer Egypt kind of deal. It's our own thing. But America just wasn't having it. 
Also, the fact is, America was kind of terrified that, like, if the West, um, including, uh, you know, Great Britain and France and Israel, decide to go ahead and attack Egypt, if Egypt was on the fence with joining the communist side, this would definitely tip them over. So America is like, huh, that wasn't us. No, no. You're looking at the old Western power. We're the new Western power. We respect your right to self-determination and not be colonized by an external force. So you know? there's a lot of posturing by America there. Yeah, yeah. So General Eisenhower, and also just to back it up, he actually sends Marines into Egypt and uh, threaten to actually attack British positions if they don't stop their shit. So hmm. on November 6th, uh, a UN ceasefire was officially put into place. And uh, the British... And French troops withdraw by December of that year. Oh, God, the UN has stepped in. Now things will yeah. stop. Sure. It was the first time they used armed peacekeeping forces because before they just used regular peacekeepers. So it's interesting that this is like the first time in history they ever did that. I'm still wow. trying to imagine what like the, the regular peacekeepers were like. Were they just like guys yeah. with like. Or, I just imagine them as like, you know, traffic cops. Yeah, they're like, please like, stop. Yeah. Guards. You know, they're, with like those like vests on and just standing. They got like flashing. They they got like glow sticks. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, don't don't do that. The UN says don't do that. Yeah, just send in a few Canadians to keep the peace. I mean, like, they couldn't do anything because they can't. They can't start a war because they're exactly. not armed. They're not there to you know protect them militarily. And like even like this is kind of sad, but even like in Rwanda, for example, like they were just they couldn't even like attack the natives so they had to just watch everything unfold and just try to keep the peace like they're very much useless <laughs> if they don't have arms and i so i'm glad i mean i guess in this situation it worked out but i yeah i don't see how they would be useful and i don't think they are useful um in current day times without arm arms yeah yeah, yeah when no, they could only kick the enemies it was really bad <laughs> <laughs> i see what you did there um. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so as a result, the UN sends in these armed uh, peacekeeping forces and they create a buffer zone in the Gaza Strip, um, as well as in parts of the Sinai and the Suez Canal area. In Israel, because it was while the British and French were racing to carpet bomb Cairo and, you know, seize the canal, Israel was slowly but surely absorbing chunks of the Sinai Peninsula into itself. So... It took them a bit more time to fully pull out, but by March of 1957, Israel was fully out of the Sinai Peninsula as well. So it seemed like everything was fine in the world. You know, Egypt is still able to maintain most of its territory. The Suez Canal is still there, despite the fact that for roughly six months, the Suez Canal was closed because first the whole nationalization bit and then the war bit kind of made it bad for traffic in the area so just imagine the worst traffic jam at this time period yeah i remember hearing about how some ships would get stuck there for crazy amounts of time or something like that yeah and also the thing is like when the egyptians chose to close the canal it wasn't like they could just turn a key and then they could lock the whole place down you know um they actually went ahead and scuttled, so they like purposefully sank forty ships into the canal zone, That's so that right. way no Locked ships could actually go through there. So you can imagine that part of the reopening of the canal, aside from like repairing all the war damage, they had to like go ahead and fucking lift out forty ships that they just sank in there. So that uh, that did take some time, and that gave a lot of people a quick start because, like, on the one hand. You know, Egypt nationalized the canal. Oh, no, we have to pay them the money now. But, like, we could still use it. But now it's, like, straight up six months, no international traffic going through the Suez Canal. So the entire world kind of freaked for a bit. And they're like, well, fuck. We got to, you know, cut our dependence on the Suez Canal because Egypt's kind of in its own crazy little world. And if Israel, France, or Britain does something like this again, we don't want to be stuck without our Darjeeling tea for another two months here, you know, or something like that. So as a result, the country started making these precautions, which in other words means, oh, we could just go around Africa again. I mean, it's not going to take us three months to do it like back in the day of like, you know, Vasco da Gama. So we could just go ahead and sail around with our cargo ships and do that. So yeah, plans, a little old fashioned yeah. circumnavigation of the continent. 
Exactly. Good times. Now it's like advanced shipping technology. Yeah. So, was it in the grand scheme of things, it wouldn't have been too hard to change tact. You, you just had to add a few more days to the overall time span for that shipping. It's no longer going to be Amazon two day delivery anymore. So. Yeah, but I want money. Well, if you want money, then you could either invade a country and get screwed by the Americans or the Soviets, or you could just kind of suck it up and, you know, sail around Africa. So. But also, I'm not sure about this, but where are they getting their oil from? Because I think that was another issue with the the Suez Canal, where I think two thirds of their oil supply was going through the canal. But I'm not sure, were they getting it from Middle Eastern countries at this point, or was it? It it was Um, from the Middle East, yeah. Okay, Um, yeah, yeah. You'd be looking at Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Mm -hmm. Kuwait. Uh, well, not really Yemen. Yemen was more a war-torn area. Um, Oman, uh, and uh, also Iran to a degree. Uh, hmm. The Iran, um, too, were shipping oil through that area. Although they were trying to build pipelines over land. It, it just didn't quite have that same volume. The Shah was still in power in Iran, right? Yeah, which is why the British were like, we toppled one government when they refused to cooperate. We could topple another one. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, they hadn't toppled it yet, right? Mossadegh was during the uh, 70s, wasn't it? That's... Well, so, so the they thing hadn't is, ousted Mossadegh yet. No, but the thing is, the the Shah... So there, there's two in... Well, I, I'm forgetting the line, but like in the most recent like Persia-Iran uh, royal family, there were only like two Shahs in power. The first one was forced to abdicate in the aftermath of World War II, uh, because the British were like, you're not popular with your people anymore. So GTFO. He's like, all right, fine. My son can take over. And he takes over. And that's the guy who's the last Shah of Iran before he gets run out of town. I believe that was Mohammad Reza Shah, right? Yes. And then he made his triumphant yeah, yeah. comeback and then he got ousted again. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it do be like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like the British were able to intervene there and also they kicked the Soviets out of there. So the British were like, yeah, we could still flex some muscle when we can. Um, you know, World War II didn't take us all the way down. Uh, but in the case of Egypt, this was a major blow towards old imperialist power. Like the whole idea that you don't like something, just send your troops in there, gunboat diplomacy, all that stuff. That kind of fell by the wayside because now it seems like, believe it or not, people actually care about international law. You know, Ugh. people are actually going to enforce that Ugh. shit. I thought this was going to be a League of Nations kind of deal where you could just go around there and they're all they're going to do is waggle a finger in your face and that's it. So, but I think this is pretty memorable. Um, the Times of London, after this whole thing, wrote about how the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Eden, was the last British Prime Minister to believe Great Britain was a great power. And he was the first to face a crisis that proved beyond doubt that Britain just wasn't anymore. (laughs) So, yeah, France, Great Britain, they're all, like, their days of glory in the sun are very much past. Yeah, and now... (laughs) Yeah. But they definitely also got, oh, they definitely got, like, replaced with um, the U.S. and the Soviet Union because also just a lasting effect of the whole Suez crisis was the involvement of the United States in the Middle East because essentially the um, Eisenhower Doctrine happened in 1957 where he um, extended from the Truman Doctrine and was like, we need to contain communism in the Middle East because pan-Arabism is essentially a communist threat. So a lot of like the future conflicts that occur is it leads away for all of those because the U.S. starts to back um, rivals to Nasser's power. So like um, the Arab Cold War occurs where... Um, Nasser's um, against uh, Saudi Arabia, and then the U.S. is like, we need to back Saudi Arabia up, just, yeah. you know, indirectly, so that we think we can have them win and we have influence in the Middle East. So it's interesting how the long-lasting effects, like, Britain left, but then the U.S. kind of just scooted in to take over their throne. Yeah. Right. And also, as, like, the foil to that, the Soviet Union, once again, like, yes, their threats to, like, launch missiles to hit, uh, to hit London were kind of overstated. Um at the same time, they're still there. And if you're going to put mm-hmm. peacekeeping forces down, the Soviets have to sign off on that too. So it's clear that the Soviets still have some sway in the area. And uh, in that Cold War thing, you can't have a Cold War without the Soviet Union as well as the Americans. So they're definitely mm-hmm. a force to stay relevant in the, uh, in the Middle East from then on. Um, but yeah. On the flip side though, Nasser 
Nasser comes out of this whole thing after his army gets literally trounced in a matter of a month. He comes out seeing this as a political win because, yeah, he got defeated, but the imperialists were forced to back down by other imperialists. But, you know, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Nasser came out as the top dog, baby. So he comes out strutting his stuff and he is like, stays you know, winning. I am the legend of pan-Arabism. Like, you want to see us become a great nation? You come to me. I'm going to make being Arab a great thing again. So he goes on and he's like, look, I'm clearly winning in Egypt already. So it's time to move this onto the global stage, baby. And uh, first thing he does, reaches out to the Soviets. He's like, my man, you backed me up when I needed that help the most. So uh, in return, why don't I come to you so you could pay for my dam? Because the Americans still haven't paid for it yet. You know, help a brother out, please. <laughs> Lamau. Please. And the Soviets were like, okay, you take money, build dam, fuck off. Um, and, He's uh, that Wow. Friend. Yeah. That was easy. <laughs> yeah, he actually got the money. And it's like, yo, this worked. Stays so like, winning. Oh, look at that. Check that off the list. Built a fucking dam that originally was the project of British imperialists in Egypt. And it was built by the forced labor of Egyptian peasants. But that's neither here nor there. Because mm-hmm. now they're, you know, it's a dam built by the Egyptians for the Egyptians by Nasser. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and just put a few statues up here and there, you know. And uh, you know what? Look, this pan-Arabism thing, I feel bad keeping it trapped inside of just Egypt here. So why don't I extend my magnanimosity out to some of my neighboring countries? So uh, this is, I think, in 58, just literally a year after the Israelis left Sinai. He goes out and reaches out to Syria, which is undergoing its own like civil war and its own coup. He's like, look, you guys need a strong hand to guide you guys to victory. Why don't I be that strong man to take over and rope you into a new country? And, uh, you know, we'll make this an equal partnership where you give me 75% of your taxes and I spend that money. Uh, equal. And, uh, yeah, and the Syrians are like, well, do what you say, Nasser. And they created the <laughs> United Arab Republic. And... Uh, Surprise, surprise, that didn't last very long. Because the Syrians are like, wait a second. Did we just get swindled by Nasser? You're wait, not no, spending I need the Syrian that money. Voice. Yeah, but it's okay because we got swindled by... An Arab. An, an Arab. And exactly. not a dirty, imperialist foreigner. And they're like, yeah, but we actually got kind of treated better under the French. <laughs> uh, so, Dang. anyways. It literally, like a few years later... T- like three years later, I want to say, the whole thing just fell apart. Um, Nasser said it was an amicable breakup, but we all know what happened there. You know, he's still crying back home in Cairo about this whole eating ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Syria, as with, I broke up with Syria. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, as with the case of like these kind of bad breakups, he has to go and find a rebound. And uh, his rebound was Yemen. Because he's little- like, his you know. side gig. Yeah, he's like, hey, the Yemen, science. I see you guys are undergoing a civil war, too. Why don't I go ahead and back you guys against those monarchist pigs? Um, and meanwhile, Saudi Arabia is like, excuse me, monarchist pigs? I'll have you know, we are actually very, very powerful creatures here. We are more like an eagle or a horse. This is a bad or soap. Or a camel. Yeah. So basically, this is where the whole, like, what, Shana, you were talking about, the whole, like, the uh the yet yeah, the um the arab cold war happens mm-hmm. because of this civil war in yemen the saudis back one wing the egyptians back the other and the saudis get the americans to back them too because they're like mm-hmm. you like oil hey you know where else there's oil yemen and america's like oh i think they could use a bit of democracy or sorry monarchy <laughs> yes you are a monarchy that's just fine that's totally cool just a um, good old american monarchy well just we'll don't back be that. communists yeah, just don't be communist. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, Nasser's like, that's fine. I'll call on the Soviets to help out. And Soviet Union's like, oh, busy with space race. Be back from moon soon. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they didn't really help out too much. But, you know, our good friend Nasser gets his troops bogged down in Yemen. It becomes literally Egypt's version of Vietnam, pretty much. And uh, 
he's desperate to like find a new way to prove that he's still got it in him. He's got his midlife crisis coming on. But he's like, yeah, no, I'm still the strong master that, you know, knocked off the French and the British out of the canal zone. He's washed. With all- Get him out of here. Yeah. He's washed. But he's like, like one final chance at glory. Uh, who do we hate the most? Like we can't hate the British and the French anymore because they're gone. Israel's still here. Yeah. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Yeah, let's do Israel. So he like he gets an intelligence report from the Soviets being like, Comrade, it seems like Israel's rallying forces on the border of your former girlfriend Syria. You might want to do something about this. And it's like, nah man, Syria is only good for me. I'm gonna step in and tell Israel to back the fuck off. Didn't so, he didn't he try to attack Israel before? Yeah, I mean those that it went yeah, great. It didn't work out. Those were border skirmishes. They ah. and they all went very, very badly. Bro, if I was trying for real, we would keep them out three days, <laughs> dude. Yeah. Yeah. If I were just, there, I just letting them win. The Israelis. Mm-hmm. Just a personal so, decision. Yeah. You know, he just wanted to let them have a chance, you know, so he could beat them up later. Mm-hmm. But now he's like, you know, Israel, you've gone too far. I'm going to step in and puff out my chest. And I'm going to cut off your shipments of oil and supplies at the Straits of Tehran. Also, we're going to pressure the UN forces to get the fuck out of the Sinai in the canal zone. Which the peacekeepers were like, well, we got nothing in this, so have fun. So they actually were like, they just straight up up and left. And Nasser's like, wait, I could have just done that this entire time? Whoops. I could have just asked them to fuck off and they fuck off? Holy shit. I think I still got some of that Nasser magic in me, yo. <laughs> Next move, it's time to go and invade Israel. And meanwhile, the other Arab states are like, yo, guys, did you hear Egypt's back in town? Yeah, they're going to take on Israel. Dude, I've been meaning to do that for a while. Let's go ahead. Is, uh, Egypt, you can't go wrong with Nasser, you know? When's he ever led us wrong? Syria's like, well, I mean, ah, we won't talk about that. Uh, Syria's the crazy girlfriend, you know? Yeah. We don't talk to Syria. <laughs> but Syria. But Syria's like, I'm in too, you know? Oh, wow. Okay, so, never mind. <laughs> so Syria arc. jumps in with the fray. Um, and Jordan's like, all right, time to do this. And they're like getting all their troops ready. And meanwhile, Nasser's like, ha yeah, Nasser's back, pan-Arabism, woo. Oh, fuck, this went a bit too far. Holy shit. And he's just like, I, I just wanted to, you know, you know, like wave my fist in the face of Israel and threaten them in case they wanted to attack Syria, which later it turns out they weren't actually doing that. They weren't actually trying to invade Syria. It was just like a military exercise. But Ugh. now, but now oh, Nasser's funny. like, oh, fuck, I can't back down now. My girlfriend's back <laughs> yeah. and she wants me to go invade Syri- uh, Israel. All what the guys are going to make fun of me. Yeah, I can't back down. And uh, Israel's like, oh, did you guys hear this? We're getting attacked again. And they're like, what, by the seven countries? The seven nation army? No, uh, no, just just three countries this time. Which three? Uh, Egypt, which we whooped. Syria, which is whooping itself. And Jordan. <laughs> which, oh, no. <laughs> all right, okay, Jordan's like kind of okay. But like, you know. It's, uh, it's like France, t- except all the seizure, seizure strikes are directed at itself. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, Lebanon's going through its own civil war. But, um... As a result, Israel's like, well, uh, what do we have that they don't have? Uh, We have competent pilots and good planes. All right, let's bomb the fuck out of them. And sure enough, on June 5th, starting with a huge bombing campaign, Israel destroys the entire air force effectively of Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. And then after six days, have pushed these three countries to the negotiation table. This war, which, surprise, surprise, is known as the Six-Day War, Basically, Oof. saw Israel take over a huge chunk of the Suez Canal, I think the entire East Bank, the entirety of the Sinai, as well as other territories like the Golan Heights from Syria. Um, and due to this whole thing, uh, from 1967 until 1975, the Suez Canal is just straight up closed. Because at this point, Egypt's on the other side from due to a ceasefire. They have troops still there. But every once in a while, they take a few pot shots towards the Israeli forces on the other side. And also, just the entire war just straight up ravaged the Suez Canal, you know. And um, if people were concerned about the nationalization of the Suez Canal being a dampener on international trade, 
the fact that the whole canal gets shut down for what eight years eight whole years yeah. it kind of makes people be like do we really need the Suez canal so by the time nasser like scrapes it back together again and he's like all right we got this canal back it, you know they fought the yom kippur war and finally reclaimed the Suez canal for themselves by 75 Everyone's like, yeah, that's cool. We're just sailing around Africa. Turns out South Africa, pretty nice place. If you don't mind the apartheid and all that jazz. Um, so at this I point... I simulated apartheid in high school. I'm wait, sorry, middle school. You did what in middle school? Oh, it's nothing. Just one of the classrooms. The teacher wanted to teach us about apartheid by having us uh, act out as if we were in apartheid for the entire class. So, How do they do know. that? So like one oh, class yeah. period or like this is a long-term project? Just, just one class period of like, I don't know what class periods were like back then, an hour or so. Yeah. Uh, basically at this, when we walk in, the teacher, she didn't tell us that we were going to be doing this either. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I don't think, to be fair, South Africa wasn't like, oh look, British colonists. And next thing you know, they're like, wait, you didn't tell us you were going to do apartheid. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it was basically the teacher uh, started ha having us pick these uh, slips, slips from a hat, and so they would tell us. I like, thought what she was making you pick like cotton or something. Oh lord! Oh, I was gonna, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, no, no, that's a little better. Uh, yeah. We we had no idea what these slips of paper, what these slips of paper for colors were, but it turns out like they determined who's going to be the slave owners, who's going to be working in the mines, who's going to be working in the houses and whatnot. Of the wow. slave owners and the and the people they're the blue colored people. Those are the slave owners. They they had to uh the teacher told them to to reprimand anybody who's not working fast enough. How uh, do you work exactly? What are you doing? I Is mean, wave your arms around. We are, the those of us who were working in the mines, uh, we had to Manual draw labor. diamonds. <laughs> 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 we had to draw diamonds. For the entire oh, yes. time, and the, those working in the houses had to draw furniture. So um, it's the it's the same job, except I'd so, honestly say working in the house wait, is a little harder. Wait, wait, when we well, get this points, the draw people so get you're points depending on. You're basically just working for Walt Disney. Yeah, this is then. yeah, this is Disney. <laughs> <laughs> you're just drawing animation, and you're getting yelled at for not working fast enough. It's like yeah, the yeah. Stanford experiment. But basically, for, we got points for course. how many things. Pretty we much. Drew. It's probably less complaining about Jews. But maybe not that much less. Compared to Disney? Yeah, yeah Disney did not knows. like Jewish people. <laughs> Apparently <No. laughs> so, yeah. But, I mean, after this whole spat, uh, Nasser here, um, he's lost pretty much all credibility internationally as like a pan-Arab superpower. He's lost a ton of credibility at home in Egypt. So he's like desperately trying to prevent another revolution. Man, you hate to see it. Uh, he... Uh, also basically lost the importance of the Suez Canal. So even though, like, nowadays, it's it's still a power to be reckoned with. It's, um, like, I think it's, like, got more than 10% of the total world's ocean trade. And at least in uh, 2007, it made around 5 billion U.S. dollars in annual revenue. So it's still a huge part of Egypt's economy. It's lost that importance as, like, the go-to place in order to pass shipping. Because people just realize... If we could go seven years without the Suez Canal, we could probably do the rest of our times with something less volatile, too. So, to cap it off, I guess, with the Suez Canal series, it starts with this whole thing as, like, a plan by the French, as early as Napoleon, trying to envision this as the new way to have the time from London to India, and it becoming the all-powerful thing that you would mortgage your fucking country for. And now it becomes something that's just, like, it's important. But after all these wars and all these conflicts over the Suez Canal, it's actually lost importance over time, despite all the conflict and death that people have put over it. So yeah, I guess they really dug their own graves with that one. Was that a was that a pun? Kind of. Wow, kind of. digging not really not really good if it was a pun or attempt at it. Yeah, you got to go a bit deeper to find a pun behind. The canals it. aren't that deep. That's true. They're this long. is actually relatively short. They are yes. very, they are very shallow compared to like reservoirs. A lot of uh, yeah, or you know, my pool. I don't have a well, pool. I mean, I guess, I guess that's the perfect metaphor for this series. It's shallow but very long, 
And uh, I guess to cut it a bit shorter, <laughs> uh, <laughs> cut it a bit shorter. We'll just call this the end of the Suez Canal. Uh, you said it, not me. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm I'm saying it. But once again, thank you for joining me on this uh, wonderful episode on the Suez Canal. Um, and this is gonna round out uh, the recording for this time as well. We're recording in the summer of 2020, COVID 19, uh, mm. and all that jazz going on. It but, just uh, ended. Move. Congratulations, everybody. It just ended. We did it. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> wow. You go, go back to school. Definitely yeah. not a bad idea that will get yeah. your kids very ill. It's going to no. ex- Exceptionalism has won once again. Yeah. We really show that COVID-19 what for. But, you know, since I am going back to class and going back to school soon, uh, this is going to be the end of the recording stuff. Um, and we might be back later on, too, whenever we get the chance. But at least with this series, this is going to mark the end for a while for Noteworthy History. But we hope you'll stick around. We'll have some more content coming up, not in the form of podcasts, but in the form of some smaller highlight videos. And uh, in the meantime, I'm Tong, and this has been Noteworthy History. And stop.